myself real quickly. I'm Mark Rambo. I kind of head up this group along with Lee Strohschein. Um, I'm the uh, president of the local historical society as well, and on the board for a couple of other organizations. <laughs> and Lee is uh, the archivist. I'm the archivist and research librarian here at the Sturgis Public yeah. Library. So if you come in looking for any history-related type question, you're directed to me. Right. And a couple of months ago, I think it was January, Lee did the program on the resources here at the library and stuff. So you can go onto our YouTube page and watch all of our old programs. They're all recorded there. This month, we're going to talk about immigration and naturalization research. Usually what we try to do is do a little presentation, and then after we get done, we do some discussion and samples of what it is we're, we're discussing. Then we try to open it up a little bit, too, for people that have questions or headaches they're <laughs> encountering with their genealogy, that kind of stuff. Questions they might want answered by the group, um, brainstorming of how to get around a brick wall or through a brick wall they might have, that kind of thing. So that's kind of the, the pattern we follow. Like I said, we try to narrow down, you know, each month a little bit of what we're, what we're doing here, you know, trying to find out records, find out travel habits of our ancestors, that kind of thing. And we thought it would be helpful to have a conversation about immigration and naturalization. Um, I guess I gotta push the correct button, there we go. So, I thought today we'd talk a little bit about general history of the American immigration. I do have a couple of handouts too that I didn't print. I'm gonna email them to everybody. So hopefully I have everybody's contacts on the sheet and I can get those emailed out. One of them breaks down uh, the history of immigration in the country and all the key years, when mm. things changed, what rules changed, that mm. kind of thing. And then there's another that's from the uh, Statue of Liberty Ellis Island organization and that uh, talks about what information is on the physically on the forms and you know when that information would change from time to time and stuff as well. So I'll get those sent out to everybody. Um, then we're going to talk about where to begin, how to figure out if you have an immigrant ancestor. We all do, obviously. But, you know, when they might have come in, where they might have come from, that kind of thing. We'll talk about the different records that are available. And then we'll talk about how to complete that story, how to tie it into what was going on in the world, maybe what was going on in the old world that caused them to leave, that kind of thing. So, American immigration, of course, most people key on the year 1620 when the Pilgrims came on the Mayflower. But everybody forgets that prior to that, there was the Jamestown Colony in 1607. That's when that was first founded, expanded greatly in 1609. And prior to that, there was uh, Spanish colonies in the southern part of what is now the United States. So Spain had St. Augustine in 1565, I think. So that was pretty early. Uh, there were, um, of course, Spanish uh, colonies, towns, whatever you want to call them, in Texas, New Mexico, California, in uh, the 16 or the 1590s. So, you know, that's all relevant to our history as well. What about New Amsterdam? When the Dutch came? The Dutch came, I want to say it was the 1630s when they first came in. And I think it was 1665 when the English took over from the Dutch. Right in there somewhere? I have a Dutch ancestor. Yep, yep, I have a few of those too. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of key years that, you know, we, we, uh, we need to recognize and what might have caused a different group of people to come at a different time mm -hmm. and place. Uh, there were a lot of points of entry originally, <clears throat> and uh, you can see there's records in New Orleans, Charleston, South Carolina, and through Canada, um, all over the place. It, immigration in those days was just whatever, wherever the boat was taking you, Baltimore, <laughs> Philadelphia, whatever. So up until the latter part of the 19th century, and that's when everything kind of got consolidated, the 1880s, they started really trying to make a system, you know, where people come in, they come through what was uh, 
Well, it wasn't Ellis Island yet then. We'll get to that. Um, but yeah, they, they had forms and all of that stuff. They tried to effectively uh, you know, collect the information of who was coming in and how. So uh, there were a lot of world events. There was a lot of religious strife. I mean, that's what brought the, uh, a lot of the earliest settlers to our shores. And, uh, lots of war, everything from the English Civil War up through the Napoleonic Wars, um, you name it, that it caused a lot of unrest in Europe and people just said, I'm done with this, we're getting out of here. Uh, the potato famine, of course, people are familiar with that, 1845 is when that started in Ireland, but also all across Europe. There was famine across Europe at that time. Um, Lots of strife and revolution. 1848, there were over 60 different revolutions that year in Europe. It was just everything blew up all at once. So, um, and economic conditions. You know, people. I like to think that people don't aren't always coming to an idea. They're fleeing from something. You know that we we, we as Americans like to think, oh, everybody saw this beautiful land of opportunity. Well, usually it was. Because they were trying to leave where there wasn't any opportunity, you know, and they heard good things, but we're going to get out of here because, mm -hmm. you know, our life isn't what, what we hoped it was going to be. Um, a lot of the times people came in and they were affected by prejudice and, um, you know, people didn't like you going against the norms. Um, you know, everybody thinks of the Puritans coming in for religious freedom. They were very strict about mm -hmm. what religious freedom you were allowed. You know, you had to believe exactly like they did, or you better get out. You know, and that's why there were so many other little New England colonies started popping up quickly, because they were kicking people out that didn't adhere to their strict belief system. Um, the Irish coming in, there was a lot of prejudice against the Irish. The British, of course, saw the Irish as kind of subhuman and brought that attitude with them when they first came and settled uh, North America. And not all people arrived as willing immigrants. You know, of course, the native peoples that were already here. You know, I have some of that in my wife's background. and um, it's, it's hard to research, very hard to research. But, you know, that, that's still a, an important segment of our, our society. African slavery, of course, that started in say 1619, was it the 1619 project is when the first yeah. African slaves were brought to what became the United States. They were <coughs> brought prior to that though went to a lot of the Spanish colonies in the Caribbean and, and Mexico and stuff. And then indentured servitude, you know, that mm -hmm. was a lot of, of people from England and stuff that were sent as indentured servants, people who had been in trouble with the law maybe, minor trouble, but they said, you know what, we, we're just going to send you over there. You're going to do an indenture and learn a craft, and you just stay over there and cause trouble there instead. <laughs> um, and then we also have a lot of mythology that's built up, you know, the melting pot and all of those things. And, and America is really not always as clean cut as all of that. They don't come and just blend in. And, you know, we have a variety of different uh, communities around the country. We have different foods. We have different cultural activities and stuff and it, it really makes it it really makes it more interesting that way you know the mythology of you know the American immigrants and stuff is is really uh, not always as clean cut as, as people want it to be okay so how do you identify immigrant ancestors as always you begin with your most recent information and work backwards we do that when we're whether we're starting a family tree and you start with yourself and work backward. Uh, if you find a new ancestor that you want to research, you start with their death and work backward, that kind of thing. So start with the most recent documentation you have. A lot of times you'll find it in your family Bible or in your family lore. Um, stories, you know, oh, our ancestors came from Norway in the 1880s, you know, that kind of thing. Um, records in the Bible that say so-and-so was born in the U.S. in 1917, but you see the older sibling was born in you know, Germany in 1915. Well, you, you can kind of get yourself a little window of time there where, where they probably were making that, 
that, uh, that move. Obituaries and burial records are great because it'll talk about, you know, uh, Swede Anderson came in from Norway in this particular year or something in obituary. The census records are really great. Um, I was just looking at the 1820 census, and I'll show you an example of it here in a little bit. Um, it actually asks in there what year you immigrated, your naturalization status, all of that kind of thing. Not all of the um, census records ask that specific question. Um, you, after 1900, they started asking more specific questions about that. Prior to that, though, you still had, well, once you started the every person census in 1850, it would tell where their birthplace was. So it might say, you know, all the kids were born in the United States, but the parents were born in Ireland, or something like that. Well, that's a good clue, because you know when the kids started being born, and when the parents were born, so it gives you, again, a window of time to start looking. Um, with, with that too, Martin, mm -hmm. some of the censuses list where the parents were born. Mm -hmm. And so if the person, your ancestor, was listed as being born, say, in Virginia, but their parents were listed as being born in England, yeah. well then, okay, at some point, I think they came... I want to say 1880. Was it 1880? Was that when they first started asking that? Okay. But well, we can look at different records. Yeah. And but that that's out. another another thing you can see. But yeah. The census. census records are great. They have a lot of that kind of information, and you'll be able to, even if it just as simple as saying, okay, they were born in England, that's a clue. But then later in the census, as it moves on, you can follow that person. It starts giving more and more information as you get to the 1900s. Yeah. And now, not necessarily all of it is true. <clears throat> yeah. I have three generations of family who all said father was born in Scotland. Mm -hmm. And then that father wasn't born, but in their censuses they said their father was born in Scotland. None of it was true. Yeah. <laughs> so. And I have a one branch of my family that came from Ireland in 1840. They are actually Protestant Irish, but they still were considered Irish. Mm -hmm. uh, so they were still frowned upon by the English. And they, on a couple senses, said they were from Wales. Yeah. So, yeah, you yeah. know, it was, yeah. the information in those are only as good as the person providing it, so. Um, you can track migration across the U.S. Sometimes you have to do that. <laughs> Sometimes they'll come in and they'll say, okay, we're going to locate at a, this place on their first immigration documents. Mm -hmm. And then they apply for their naturalization at a different place. And then a couple years, a few years later, when they actually become naturalized citizens, they're in a completely different place yet. So sometimes you have to kind of track that migration. Sometimes they're migrating with the same people. They're migrating with neighbors and family members that they came over with. Um, so you can kind of, if you can't find them, maybe you can find the other people that are, are surrounding them. That fan, uh, fan method, the friends, and friends, acquaintances, acquaintances and, and neighbors. Yeah, friends, acquaintances, neighbors. Yeah, good people to eat us. Thank you. Um, likely points of entry, ports of entry. That's really, you know, like I said before, if, if you know they came into the southern U.S., if they suddenly appear here, they, they might have come in through Virginia or South Carolina or New Orleans or something. Um, rather than everybody coming through New York. It's not always as cut and dry as that. I had trouble finding a couple of my mom's, well, her grandparents came from, they were Germans from Russia, and I could not find her dad and his parents coming through Ellis Island for anything. Well, they didn't. They came into Canada and then immigrated down from Canada, so straight into North Dakota. So. It, it's not always, you know, come to Ellis Island, wave at the Statue of Liberty, <laughs> get, your, get your walking papers. Uh, there's, there's more to it than that. And then understand the history of the immigration in the U.S. That's an important thing, too, if you're trying to narrow down when somebody might have come. If you understand that there were segments of time where we blocked a lot of certain groups from coming or we blocked anybody from coming, that kind of thing. Uh, after 1924, we started blocking people big time uh, from coming in. 
there was after 1882 was the Chinese Exclusion Act because they didn't want them coming in and competing for for jobs. So they anybody that was Chinese, no nope, Japanese, still good. Everybody else, but no Chinese. So you know if you understand the history of all that, it, it helps you on that journey of trying to find when they came and from where. Here's we were talking about some of these. I didn't put everything and I do have a handout that I told you I'm going to send out and I'll email that out. It has a lot more dates than this. Oh. Um, but these are these are a few key things, you know. Um, well, 1825 England repeals immigration laws. Prior to that they had to get permission to leave. And they usually granted it, but they wanted to know who was leaving and they kind of kept a certain, you know, trickle going. But 1825, England decided they were full and they started just opening it up and everybody could go wherever they wanted to. So, you know, you can see a, a rash of immigration from, from that part of the world. The Napoleonic Wars, I mean, again, nothing from about 18, early 1800s to about 1815. You're not going to see anything from Europe very much because everybody was so involved in the all the wars that were going on. But after 1815, a lot of people started going. They were like, okay, wars are done, we're getting out of here before this kicks up again, because if that, those wars kept recycling, you know, and coming around again and again. And they were like, we don't know what's going to happen next. So again, you can kind of follow some of the things that, that was happening and, and get an idea of when uh, your ancestor might have left any particular part of the world. Uh, 1862 was the Homestead Act, free land, that was huge, and that started, word started getting around of that in different parts of Europe, particularly Western and Northern Europe. Uh, a lot of Scandinavians started coming after that. Um, of course, there's not a lot of arable land in, in Scandinavia, and people started saying, okay, we're, we're going to go take advantage of that. Um, 1892 was the opening of Ellis Island and the formalizing of the process of immigration. Uh, it was decided by the Supreme Court in the 1880s that the federal government was in charge of immigration. Prior to that, a lot of different states were doing their own thing and, and uh, you know, naturalizing people and doing whatever, you know, state by state. Uh, but the, they decided at that time the federal government was in charge of the whole process and that's when they started uh, preparing all the system and planning Ellis Island and so on. Literacy requirements kicked in in 1917 during World War I. Um, prior to that, you know, you didn't have to be literate to come into the country, but you had to prove you were after 1917. <coughs> and of course, then they started imposing the first permanent limits in, limits in 1924, saying this is the number of people we'll take. <coughs> And they have to be from these regions and that kind of stuff. Okay, so what kind of records are we looking for? Um, there's really two different things here. There's your emigration, immigration, and then there's your naturalization process. Emigration, of course, is leaving a country. Immigration is coming into a country. And I wanted to put both there, though, because there's records at both ends sometimes. Not just coming into this country, but when you leave your home country. Sometimes there's two sets of ship records, and I have an example of that I'll show you. Um, so you can start with the port of arrival here, you can, if you find it in New York or wherever. Um, but sometimes there's also the passenger ship records from the port of departure. And they'll have a little bit different information. The names are going to be the same and stuff, because un like a lot of people's theories, um, the, the uh, government officials at Ellis Island did not change people's names. That's always a big myth that is around. Mm -hmm. Yep, the uh, people at Ellis Island changed the spelling of our name. Well, that didn't happen. They would take the names directly as they were spelled from the ship's manifest. Put them on there and they had people there that were all multilingual and understood every language and could converse directly with each of the of the uh, immigrants and uh, 
if they changed the spelling of their name, they changed it. Usually it was during their naturalization process that they would change it uh, to anglicize it, make it a little more, um, you know, U.S. friendly. So, um, census records, of course, 1850, we talked about every name census um, begins in 1850. Prior to that, it only listed the head of household and then different age categories, male, female, that kind of thing. Um, but in 1850, there's an every name census, and it says the place of birth for each person. Uh, after 1900, they start listing specific immigration information and your citizenship status. Um, like I said before, watch for the birth years of children. If you know that your ancestor was, came from Germany, but you're not sure when, watch the children. You know, there may be a couple of their children were born in Germany and then a couple were born in the U.S. And that gives you a, a real good idea of where, where to look for, for their immigration process. Um, and the language spoken. Again, my ancestors that were Germans from Russia, you know, it said they came from Russia, but the language they spoke was German. So that's another clue that it's not a clear cut, it's just, well, they're Russians coming. The Port of New York then became Castle Garden in the 1850s, and it was Castle Garden until Ellis Island opened in 1892. So you'll see those kind of changes that occur. Um, the nice thing is, like the Ellis Island uh, organization, there's a nonprofit, it's called the Statue of Liberty and Ellis Island.org, is the website. Um, they have all the Castle Garden records on there as well. So you can see everything from the 1850s up through you know, the early 1900s um, with Ellis Island. So those are the kind of records you could look for. Uh, the departure records, uh, the arrival record, and then the port records. You know, when they came in, again, through Ellis Island or wherever, there's a record of them being registered. Some people were held because they had medical conditions. Um, most people were not. I think they only said that one or two percent of people ever got held and returned back to their country. Um, but it did happen sometimes if people were, were desperately ill or uh, somehow not up to our standard at the time. Once they were in the country, then the naturalization process is what you want to follow. So uh, the Declaration of Intent is the first thing that they do, and that's just uh, filing paperwork with the court if they want to become an American citizen. Uh, there's a naturalization petition that goes out then. They usually have to find their certificates of arrival in order to prove when they arrived. This is, of course, once the formal process was in place. Um, so there's numerous different opportunities here to find records, is what I'm trying to get to, I guess. The Oath of Allegiance Ceremony, the Certificate of Naturalization, those are both at the very end of the process. Um, Civil War, there was military service you could bypass. If you were born in Ireland or England or whatever, and you were fighting for the Union, they gave you citizenship. Not everybody took advantage of that, but most people did. Why wouldn't they, you know? Uh, another good indicator of naturalization is a voter registration list. If you can find somebody on the voter registration list, you know they became a citizen at some point. So now you know, okay, now I need to look for the citizenship process, you know, the naturalization process. Because they're a voter, they ought to be a citizen. Other kinds of records, of course, the voter registration. Some of these I've put on here, they're not really tied to specifically the immigration process and naturalization process, but they are indicators of status, of your citizenship status or immigration uh, where you're moving around to. Uh, voter registration, I mentioned, resident alien registration, World War I. My great grandfather had to register as a resident alien because he was born in Germany and it never gone through the naturalization process. Um, war bride records. People bring coming home from war would bring a bride from overseas with them. There's documentation of that. They had to be 
registered to come into the country. Um, and that might give you some really neat information. I have one of those I'll demonstrate for you as well. Newspaper announcements. A lot of times it's in the paper. Who is applying for citizenship? Um, so and so receives citizenship, that kind of thing. So watch the newspapers in their area. That's often a place to look. Of course, obituaries, we mentioned that before. Um, you know, it might say in there when they arrived, or, you know, at least a window arrived at when he was a youth with his parents, you know, that kind of thing, and it kind of gives you a window again of, of where to look and when. Ethnic newspapers, I'll bring up a couple of those. I have some German language newspapers that were published out of North Dakota, and they went all over the world <laughs> because there were people that were Germans from Russia emigrating all over the place, uh, to South America, Canada, the U.S., back to Germany, and this was, there were ethnic newspapers specifically for that, where they, people write letters to the newspaper to inform other people where they were and what they were doing. Uh, and that happened with other ethnicities as well. I have a friend that was a German from Russia. <coughs> yeah. Uh, the Staatsanzeiger was the newspaper I found. It was <coughs> state, stands for state. Um, oh, the word is just going to go right now. Baker made me Klein. Oh, okay. And that's a pretty common yeah. German name. And then she married a McGuire. <laughs> One thing we can look at doing too is Google <coughs> Translate, because that's what I used when I was trying to translate some of this. It's not just German, some of it's old German, you know, with the weird characters and stuff. And uh, it's not always easy to translate. You can just drag an image of that into Google Translate, and it'll just spit out a translation for you. Sometimes it, it's a little hard to read. Sometimes you got to kind of reinterpret because it'll literally translate every word. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, you know, combinations of words are a little different. So you kind of have to read between the lines a little bit. But it does work really well. Mm -hmm. And then other records in family collections. Sometimes somebody has somebody's naturalization certificate. Or they have, you know, letters that were written back and forth to the old country, that kind of thing. Um, so family collections are a good place to look as well when you're looking for ideas. You know, sometimes it's not as clean cut as saying, well, we know they came in 1881 from this town in Sweden. You know, we don't know that. So we have to, we have to work our way back again and try to figure that out. Other strategies. Remember that usually up until again into the 1900s even, the wife and children were not naturalized separately particularly children, they were usually naturalized under a parent, usually the, the, the dad, the, the male of the family. The wife was the same case, and, uh, it was in the teens, somewhere, 19 teens, somewhere, I can't remember off the top of my head, that women had to start doing the process on their own. Prior to that, they, the husband did it for the family. Um, not everyone traveled together. You might find a record and you think, oh, well, that can't be my ancestor because his whole family's not this. It's just him. Where's his wife and kids? Well, sometimes they traveled separately. One of them would come over, send money back, a couple of the kids would come, and then a couple years later, the wife and the other kids would come, that kind of thing. So you kind of have to get creative when you're looking at records and know that people are traveling in weird, weird combinations sometimes. Um, track the fan club members. We mentioned the fan club earlier. The friends, associates, and neighbors. Um, sometimes some people say family, associates, and neighbors. But if you're looking on a ship's um, listing of who's on the ship coming over, a lot of times they're all traveling together. Sometimes they're neighbors and they're from a neighboring town or they're from the same town. Sometimes they have the same last name but they're listed in different parts of the, of the, of the listing. So you gotta look through all the names that are listed on that ship and try to figure out if there's any combinations that make sense. And then you can track those people as well. You can start tracking you know, the neighbors and, and people from the same town, that kind of thing, to see if they, maybe they're all going to the same place. And then again, you can get another clue. 
check all spellings. And we've talked about spelling before, but you know we're we're really hung up today on how our names are spelled. But there was no set way of spelling anything up until the mid 1800s, and even then. A lot of people, especially if they were illiterate or only partially literate, didn't even know how to spell their own name. They'd say it and somebody would spell it out phonetically. So I've found records from colonial times where one of my ancestors has his last name spelled three different ways in the same document because they just spelled it how it sounded. You know? um, so don't get too hung up on, you know, well, our name is Wolf with an E on the end because not everybody knew there was an E on the end. Um, maybe not everybody in the same family spelled it that way. Um, so check all possible spellings. Um, be prepared to let go of family lore. It's a great clue. It's a great place to start, but it's not always accurate. And sometimes you find out that you know the family didn't come on this particular date. They came ten years after that or something. Um, be, be prepared to move on from that story, you know, if, if the documents and records prove otherwise. Learn all you can about the time and place they left behind. Was there political strife, economic uh, strife going on, you know, was there a big drought? Um, what kind of opportunities were there for your, and in most cases, we're talking about people who were, you know, your common, everyday, working class, you know, that came here. Um, what kind of opportunities were there for people in their circumstances uh, to move out of that circumstance? Um, and then again, follow the family. Don't just follow your one ancestor. Try to follow the entire family. Uh, maybe there was an uncle that came over years before and that's who they were coming to meet. Um, so follow the entire family um, from the old country to this country. And then tell the full story. You know, don't hesitate to talk about some of the, you know, seedier things that might have been going on in that old country, or you know, the the economic conditions they lived under. You know, that's all important information to your story. Um, knowing why people left. Like I said, usually they were leaving something behind, not necessarily, you know, running towards something. They were running away from something a lot of times. Um, don't be afraid to tell that story. And then look beyond the romanticism, you know. <laughs> you know, you get up to that Victorian era and everything gets all, you know. I always go off on Victorian, sorry. But, uh, you know, look beyond that. Look behind the curtain a little bit to find out what was really going on. You know, maybe there's children's <coughs> birth years that don't match up with when dad was around or whatever. You know, that stuff happens. <laughs> It's part of your story, so. <coughs> That's all I had on, on that. Does anybody have questions about anything? Any of the records, any of the methods? I do, like I said, have some samples I want to run through and show you some census records and, <coughs> and ship manifests, that kind of thing. But, yeah. Where, in this area, do we find naturalization records? It depends on when, really, and I know that that can be my answer a little bit. Um, but you can you can go through the National Archives and see what they have. I would suggest checking Ancestry.com, checking FamilySearch.org, some of those resources because those have a lot of that information. County. <coughs> Judicial records sometimes will have it. So here in Meek County, where would that be? County courthouse. At the courthouse. Okay. Yep. And Pennington County would be the courthouse. Yeah. Yeah. At that time, there it wasn't always through the federal courthouse. Right. Most of the time, right. it was through yes. your local, and they would sign on behalf of you know okay. the state or behalf of the federal government that kind of thing. Okay. So they had all the documents and stuff there though. And of course, that changes through time. Like I said, that's why I said it depends on when. Um, you know, before 18, early 1880s, it could have been just a local official saying, "Okay, you're a naturalized citizen. Here you go." Um, 
<coughs> without following any process. Right. So it, it changes. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. I, I just got a story to share because we're talking about immigration records. I have, it was the sister of one of my ancestors. They came from Ireland, sailed across in 1846, I think it was. The sister was born at sea on the boat ride mm. over. And you know, it's family story that everybody knew, mm -hmm. but it is a true family story. There is one census record that I've seen where her place of birth is listed as at sea. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And her, I think it's an obituary, wow. I found where it mentions that she was born at sea. Yeah. And, and the dates match up with when the family arrived here and so her then, birth date. But if you didn't was have she a considered date, a U.S. citizen or a citizen of the home country? Well, they Boy, came, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> they, yeah no. they came from Ireland. And they were living when they got here, so probably, yeah. Question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and and if you didn't know when they arrived, but you knew when she was born, and that she was born at sea, boy, yeah. now you have a real narrow window. That yeah. You can, Could be you know, know, the nationality weeks. of the ship. You know, yeah. what's flying the ship? Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I'll show you on one of these that you know it says that it's a. Uh, they're leaving Germany, but it's a Danish ship. You know that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. so. and, and I found another something that I found on one of them. It was a census record. It was for, it was the sister of my grandfather. On the 1900 census, it stated she was born in Massachusetts. My grandfather was born in Germany. And they came to Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. How did they get to Massachusetts? So I did a little research, <clears throat> found a record. I found her birth record from 1891, I think it was, in Massachusetts. They were living in Boston, Massachusetts. Mm. I have no idea because they landed in New York. Mm. They sailed and came in through New York. Then they went to Boston and then Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. But I'd never come across that any place and sadly all my dad's siblings have passed away so I can't even ask family. Well, like, like we were saying before though, you've got to watch where kids were born. Mm -hmm. You know, that is a huge clue, yeah. and they bumped around when they first got here. They would bounce around, and yeah. sometimes they might file paperwork here and finalize it there. You yeah. know, that kind but, of thing. But, so. you know, her being listed born in Massachusetts threw up a red flag, you know, but I'm like, okay, is that correct? But then finding a birth records, record yeah. of her in Massachusetts, mm -hmm. it's like, okay, they were there. 